Welcome to the new school program, which takes place in the context of the Bauhaus Imaginista project. Uh, I'm neither um, Marion von Osten nor I'm uh, Hugh Grant, uh, Grant Watson. Uh, my name is uh, Ben Schera, and I'm the director of this wonderful institution, which is called HKW. But I would like to thank uh, Marion von Osten and Grant Watson for conceptualizing this wonderful program. And I would like also to thank my theme, uh, especially Katinka Pakwati, Jessica Pes, uh, Laura Mattis, and Karima Kotb for producing uh, this event. I also extend my thanks to our cooperation partner, which is the Bauhaus Corporation on the one side, but also the Goethe Institute, and my special thanks goes to the Foreign Office, which provided special funding for this project. I would like to share with you some observations which I find relevant from the perspective of the HKW in the actual discussions concerning art schools and pedagogical concepts. Looking at the beginning of the Bauhaus and other institutions presented in the Bauhaus Imaginista project, such as the Kala Bhavan in India or the Ecole des Beaux-Arts in Casablanca, it is interesting to see that they all are very critical about the existing academic art institutions. They are radically criticizing them, challenging their structures, contents, and positions. And they do so not so much by intellectual discussions, but by introducing new practices to transform individuals as well as society. At the end, but, they do not discard the idea of the institution itself. They want to revolutionize its content and form, but not give up the concept. In the last 20 years, we are in a situation where public art institutions were attacked from both sides, the neoliberal state and the institutional critique. And in brackets, I want to say, of course, that the criticism by the institutional critique was, of course, very much understandable, looking at institutions which became more and more rigid, which became more and more working on canonized uh, concepts and being not any more providing adequate answers to the situation. But the consequence of this process was the erosion of public institutions. This opens the neoliberal state and the corporate world a direct access to the individual, thereby undermining social and communal engagement. I would like to argue that we need cultural institutions as places of resistance against the perversities of the existing system. One has to see and analyze these perversities in order to understand the challenges the new schools are confronted with. And I have four perversities. First perversity, the transformation of subjectivity and creativity, which is at the heart of the art education, into an individualism where the individual is not anymore conceived as a subject which is exploring herself in interactions and relations with others, but is an atomic unity which works only on its personal enhancement. With respect to this perversity, we have to conceive the new schools as places which support social interaction and engagement also as part of subjectivity uh, formation. Second perversity, digital capitalism is based on exploring creativity and all forms of self-enhancement in commodifying the data they get from the individuals. They sell them as part of their business models. As an answer to this perversity, we need new schools as places of analog interactions and laboratories of new forms of corporations, as spaces where the data collection of the platform do not have direct access to, where experience and thoughts and practices are shared without being connected to the digital world directly. Third perversity, there are two important shifts 
The one concerns the paradigmatic figure of the critical discourse, from the worker in the 20th century to the refugee in the 21st century. And the other is a shift of discourse frames itself, from the discourse of internationalism to the discourse of globalization. Both shifts are in such a way interconnected that they produce the third perversity. In the internationalism of the workers' movement in the 20th century, the worker was the active agent trying to shape international relationships. In the discourse of the globalization of the 21st century, the refugee becomes the object of global governance system. Her life gets regulated by administrative regulations of existing nation states in order to avoid that her role is questioning existing political structures. That means the terminology of globalization and governance is taming the paradigmatic figure of the 21st century, which could and is implicitly challenging the system. We have to develop practices which challenge exactly these taming processes. We have to build coalitions which allow to make visible what the system tries to disguise and to make invisible. The fourth and last perversity. Looking at the Anthropocene world we created during the last century, we live in a situation of urgency. Caused by climatic change, reduction of biodiversity, collapse of national politics, and so on. But there is also a logic of urgency created by the digital world, a nervousness produced by constantly involving people into the social media. We are never alone, permanently acting and reacting. This produces a nervousness which presents us from which prevents us from really challenging the system. There is no time for revolution. With regard to this perversity, we need new schools which provide spaces where time is suspended, which allows a non-intentional logic of interaction and production. The answer to the urgencies we are confronted with is not following the time and functional logic of the system, but to engage into perhaps time-consuming counter-strategies in order to develop profound counter-positions. In this sense, I wish us all a good time during the next two days. Thank you very much. I bring some color into the <laughs> on the stage. And uh, I deeply welcome everybody for a new, the, a new school, con school conference, which was actually a long time a wish to do this uh, because of the whole experience of the projects of the last years. 2016, Grant Watson and me started uh, with a large team of researchers. And I will give you some of the thoughts of some schools today, including the Bauhaus, which will not be addressed because we could not invite everybody <laughs> uh, or it would have been three days. So um, with this first day of our conference, we aim to rethink the Bauhaus School's exceptionalism and its pedagogical ethos from the perspective of other schools and learning sites established in the 20th century that in part are also on display here in the exhibition at HKW. With a change on perspective of Bauhaus Imaginista, the Bauhaus School is placed into a network of multiple modernist pedagogical experiments and sites of learning from the early to the mid of the 20th century, one could say. Engaging with the perspective of worlding the Bauhaus, two critical shifts in perspective are taken to challenge existing historiography. First, by thinking through its pedagogical program as a knot of ephemeral translocal connections, and second, as a product of globally circulating knowledge, politics, subject, and object forms. To deepen this concern, we have invited international scholars and practic practitioners, many of them research advisors, authors of the online journal or, or publication, as well as colleagues for the workshops tomorrow, with whom we share concerns on art and education internationally. And to ask what we are able to learn from this transnational histories of radical pedagogy for today's art and design education. 
I would like to thank the Haus der Kulturen der Welt and all the teams have working with us as well as uh, uh, speakers who are coming and the workshop leaders uh, because I think it's a very speci special interest that we all share. When we started in 2016 by conceptualizing the first of our four chapters corresponding with, we decided already to discuss Bauhaus pedagogy in relation to two Asian schools, the Kalabhavan, founded by Rabindranath Tagore in 1919, same year as the Bauhaus, near Calcutta in India, and the new school for architecture and design, founded by the architect Renshishiro Kawakita in Tokyo in the 1930s. The work of local researchers and advisors were central for a reading of the Bauhaus pedagogy internationally. And for the context of the 20th century Japan, we were able to learn, for example, that the rejection and the reception of Bauhaus pedagogy meant always to reassemble and combine pedagogical approaches. In Japan, from different phases of the Bauhaus, with East European constructivism, functionalist and Japanese socialist concepts. For Renshishiro Kawakita, as well an important publisher and translator, active in the modernist scenes in Tokyo, the pedagogical practice of Bauhaus was foundational to develop a new concept of art education in Japan that would enable children and grown-ups uh, to central principles of Gestaltung that could be applied to many fields of life and not just designed objects. And it's interesting that the term Gestaltung, uh, the German one, which is not similar to design, was much more relating to Kosai, which is a Japanese notion of Gestaltung, which includes all elements of life and not just objects. In Kawakita's pedagogical vision, diverse concepts as Albers Forkus studies, Kandinsky's concept of Spannung, Moholis and Itten's teaching principles, or Gertrude Gruner's ideas, a forgotten female master, at the Bauhaus on synesthesia, rhythmic education, and the development of personhood, were translated into the Japanese language of, and society. Kawakita, who never went to Germany, had always been in contact with visitors and students of the Bauhaus Weimar and Dessau, who brought insights from different periods. With its magazine series, I See All, a really amazing publishing series that you see in the exhibition published in the 1930s, he created a new transnational vision of modernist concepts. The goal of this impressive publishing initiative was a democratization of education, and with it, what Jacques Concert calls a distribution of the sensible, a dissemination of the field of aesthetics into the everyday, into the everyday and beyond existing elite classes. The Bauhaus Bücher publication series that you also find in the exhibition were likewise collecting different voices internationally, from Malevich and to Mondrian. And it is mediation and publishing activities that help to develop criteria for a new vocabulary of creation and to imagine and to actually constitute the modern movement. And it was not a linear process. The polyphony of the Bauhaus program, the constant change and revision of the curriculum, the invention of learning and unlearning practice, as Regina Bittner names it, speaks about its heterogeneity and transnational paths that one can learn through its dissemination and reception. Publishing and printing activities in early 20th century created, as Pasa Mitter expresses, a virtual cosmopolis, and with it the conditions for a global dialogue that did not depend on nationalistic or colonial power relations or on personal contact. Each pedagogical reform revisited also reflect local political and geopolitical conditions, and texts by Gropius, Maya, Albers, Tagore, Bobadi, Duarte, the Casablanca School, Kavakita, and many others have informed us to understand commonalities and differences. And a revision of Bauhaus' resonances and receptions also includes the rejection of European modernism, including the Bauhaus, as in the Brazilian case, and the resistance against colonial modern education in its subject and object forms in the short century of decolonization. And it also included the subversion of educational institutions, as we will hear in Mark Wickler's talk. In my introduction, I would like to extract some of the, the pedagogical principles that have been now addressed with mediation and communication, and another, I would say, is accessibility. 
Access to diverse ideas and practices was a central aim of the Bauhaus program, but also access to new means of production through the installation of workshops in which students were asked to find their own solutions to invent and generate new techniques involving manual skills and learning through experience, instead of copying masters as in the art academies of the same time. With reference to the Weissensee School in Berlin and the Bauhaus graduate Selman Selmanagic, the underlying system critical basic idea of the Bauhaus program will be reflected in the input by Simone Hein, which is in her words, emancipation. Access also meant that many of the international students were coming from non-academic backgrounds, as did Philipp Tolsina, a Bauhaus, a Bauhausler highlighted in the work of Alice Kreischer that you can see in Gallery 1 here. Kreischer reminds us that Tolsina was coming from the background of a basket and broom maker uh, family before inscribing of Hannes Meyer's architecture course founded in 1927. Access to art and design education looks radically different today. Studies on students' life of the 21st century show that contemporary art, architecture, and design students come mainly from an educated or even upper-class background, and that exclusion to design education it goes further when we leave the Schengen space. Facing missing infrastructures, ask students to pay high entry fees at specially rated neoliberal art and design schools abroad. But do these schools provide knowledge needed in local context is what Christian Benimana will ask in his presentation later today. Radical art education reforms of the 20th century were aiming radical inclusion. Everybody can learn everything. This radical premise would include to ask what is actually necessary to learn, what shall learning and unlearning provide for whom and why a discussion we hope to be able to touch today with contributions by the educator and edu activist Sandra Benitez from Brazil and the Nigerian architect and artist Demas Nvoko, um, as well as in the workshops tomorrow. Let's go back to the Bauhaus architect Philo Tolsina. In his personal arch archive, conducted over years in the his tiny flat in Moscow, photos, letters, and documents show how students became part of the building process of, for the Balcony House in Tessau Turton, as well as for the Trade Union School in Bernau. These were designed by Maya Witwa and in parts also by Ari Sharon. Male as well as female students were in responsibility of parts of the interior and exterior design and the building process. They were learning on site. They were learning literally to build. The construction side, the process of making as a form of para-institutional learning, runs as an alternative idea of learning and education through the long history of the 20th century. This practical model was already established by Gropius in projects as the House Sommerfeld, the House Am Horn, and the Turton Settlement. This also included to learn from each other and not only to have manual skills, but also social skills cooperation. Building experience as realized in cooperation in another political and societal context will be addressed by the architecture historian Bayo Amole, presenting the IFE campus in West, of the West Nigerian Obafemi Avolovo University, designed by Ari Sharon between 1960s and 80s, and the building complex still functions today as a model architecture for learning practices in many senses. But the perspective of building of architecture, urbanism, and with this, the process of industrialization also found its criticism in the post-war era. In 1954, <laughs> the Danish artist Asger Jorn wrote, Max Bill has undertaken to restructure the Bauhaus. He wishes to make a school without painting, without research into the imagination, fantasy, science symbols. All he wants is a technical instruction, an industrial art school. In the name of experimental artist, I intend to create an international movement for an imaginist Bauhaus. The foundation of an international movement for an imaginist Bauhaus in Alba in Italy 1955 by Jorn, Pino Galizio and Simondo finally fused, as some of us know who have seen the exhibition here about the Situationist, into the Situationist International Movement. Their critique of design schools organized around utilitarianism, industrialization, and consumption addresses questions of, for art and design education today that also includes the critical function of the visual arts within the Bauhaus and beyond. 
At the heart of the Bauhaus curriculum stood the synthesis of all the arts. This inter-arts concept was based on the radical institutional critique and formed against the division of fine and applied arts as a critical intervention into disciplinary divisions and functions of art in a former feudal, nationalistic and militaristic society. A concept that became relevant in post-independence Morocco from 1962 onwards, but was also strongly recalibrated and adapted. As Tony Maraini shows, the relation between design craft and the visual arts became highly political when artists wanted to decolonize the art education in Morocco, and some of these works you see in the exhibition. The Ecole de Casablanca artist group's approach was to consider handicrafts as a popular mode of cultural expression, including interiors, local non-figurative forms of expression, calligraphy, and rural decorative patterning practices. These were not only considered as examples of an abstract system of signs and symbols, as, as often rooted in the Western reading, but the group emphasized the social function of an object, the way it was used by people that was co-equal importance for its formal characteristics. This focus on usability also required a new understanding of the arts in society, and artists who are looking for engagements in the public spheres or in architecture projects or also asked for the development of a new epistemology that would include African culture into the post-colonial movement. The Casablanca School was the first in institution that used the word popular arts, the word popular arts, art populaire, as before the French used the word folklore, artisanat, or native arts, or the colonial expression les arts indigènes. As Tony Maraini expresses, we needed to change those words and meanings as they were politically charged. The real popular arts were also disappearing. Industrial production killed the local arts and we forgot the knowledge and how to do them and what they were for. This necessary intervention by artists and theorists, overlooked by art history for many years, an intervention into the relation of colonial modern discourse, knowledge, and practice, is articulated in a moment when the promise of a capitalist consumer society and the international division of labor became manifest as a global condition. And I would like to give the word to Grant Watson. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Marion, and thank you, everybody, for coming on this beautifully sunny Saturday morning. Um, I just want to follow up on what Marion said with just a few sort of thoughts about the exhibition. Um, I was, when, when I was thinking about this talk and about the importance of the role of schools for our project, I was sort of reflecting on the fact that in the past when I've been to Bauhaus exhibitions um, that really deal with the historical Bauhaus when it was active as a school, I often become so enthralled by the objects, by a, a pool clay painting or a tubular steel chair or a photograph or whatever it is, that I forget that this is actually a, a teaching. It's an exhibition about a teaching situation. And what was interesting for me and maybe also for Marion in the development of, in the evolution of our project is that we sort of slowly, I think, started to realize the importance of the schools. And when we <coughs> started to think, okay, how many schools do we have in our exhibition? It was like, there's another, there's another, there's another, there's another, there's another. And suddenly we realized the exhibition itself is full of these representations of schools. And when you, most of you probably have seen the show, but if you, you haven't, you obviously can uh, follow up and, and, and identify them for yourself. And even where um, in some of the displays you have particular objects, for example, with the, <clears throat> the, the Marguerite Wildenhain ceramics, which are kind of such, such beautiful objects in their own right, they're also sort of embedded within ar archival and film material that locates them within, you know, Pond Farm as a, as a, as a space of uh, teaching, uh, important space of teaching. Um, and so as we began to develop the project, we realized that one of the focuses should be on schools. And as Marion has said, this, the first chapter of the exhibition corresponding with deals exclusively with three schools and shows um, these teaching materials from those schools. What was very important for us in terms of the idea of uh, Bauhaus pedagogy and Bauhaus reception in general was to get out of the idea of a diffusion model. So the idea that the Bauhaus is traveling uh, seamlessly to other contexts and being taken up 
Um, and to think instead, not about influence, but instead about the to position the Bauhaus in relation to a whole series of other movements and educational projects. Um, and it's interesting, Rainer Wick um, wrote a book about Bauhaus teaching, and in it he says, you know, the, he talks about the impossibility of the translation of the Bauhaus pedagogy, given that the Bauhaus itself was occupying very particular historical and economic circumstances, the role that was played by the, um, the, the teachers, the important figures that were kind of present in the Bauhaus, and also, as Marion has pointed out, the internal heterogeneity of the Bauhaus itself. So it's a kind of very complicated uh, project over the course of its lifetime. Um, the, in, in terms of Bauhaus pedagogy, it was established, of course, in 1919 by uh, Walter Gropius with the Manifesto, which I think is interesting in the sense that it provides this combination of a, a social vision with a very practical um, set of applications. So he gives detailed account of the different courses which will be uh, offered at the Bauhaus. And the Curriculum included, I think, as many of you know, the, the, the preliminary course, which was the perhaps the kind of bedrock of a Bauhaus teaching um, and a mandatory part of the education of Bauhaus students. So when they came, uh, initially it was six months, it was extended to a year. And it's been, in a way, the most resilient of all of the aspects of Bauhaus pedagogy. So when we look to the other schools uh, in our research, we see that the preliminary course is something which has been taken up um, and, to a certain extent, adapted. Um, but there are ideas from the preliminary course which also remain. Um, even in the United States, where Bauhaus ideas are supposedly the most comprehensively transferred, um, within the 50 or so Bauhauses that traveled to the United States and stayed there for any period of time, uh, they were forced to adapt when they were taking up teaching positions in the United States. And Gabriella Diana Graw, who writes an article in the end of Reiner Wick's book, which was one of the, uh, for me, quite important texts which talks about the dissemination of Bauhaus pedagogy. She says that, um, you know, they, of course, were the very famous leading figures of the Bauhaus, uh, Gropius and uh, Albers and so forth, but there were many, many teachers who kind of found uh, employment in different educational establishments in the United States. And what she said about this was that actually they had to very much uh, specialize in terms of um, really surviving in a free market economy. So the interdisciplinary idea, uh, in, in, in many respects, had to be um, sort of honed into a much more kind of specialist way of, much more specialist way of uh, teaching. Um, so what we've done in our exhibition, in our project, is we've looked at different case studies of schools, and Marion has already uh, identified quite a few of these. Um, as she said, in corresponding with, we start with uh, three schools. One of those schools was established the same year as the Bauhaus in 1919, and this was a very intentional decision on our part, because what we wanted to do was get away from the idea of the Bauhaus as the kind of originator of all interesting ideas about experimental pedagogy in the early 20th century, and say that no, it was part of a kind of broader network of thinking. And of course, what we're doing when we uh, claim this is we're drawing on scholarship of people such as Partimitta, who've talked about modernism, who's kind of reframed modernism away from the idea of modernism in a way sort of revolving around certain key European institutions and figures and seeing it more as a network, a transcultural network, which could be exemplified by somebody like Rabindranath Tagore, who in the early 20th century, when he set up his school Kalabhavan in Shantanaketan in the 1920s, was interrogating what it means to be modern from the context of India. And then other case studies, as Marion has already said, um, look at the mid 20th century and the way that teaching practices become integrated into processes of nation building in newly independent states. And here again, we see a process of adaptation and partial adoption of Bauhaus pedagogy. 
Um, so in the Ecole de Casablanca and also in the National Institute of Design, we will have a presentation on the latter by uh, Suchitra Balasubramaniam later. Um, yes, some aspects of Bauhaus pedagogy were picked up and used, but they had to be somehow um, uh, brought into a relationship with um, materials and ideas about design and architecture from much more immediate sources. And then um, towards the end of the 20th century, in examples such as MIT in the, in the States and the Leeds School of Art in, in the UK, we see how developments in technology and also the emergence of um, youth culture uh, in, in the post-war period completely transformed the notion of what was possible and what was desirable for young people coming into art and design education in the 1970s, 80s, and perhaps early 90s. Um, so our research, as, as, as has been said, um, withdrew and was built on uh, relationships with scholars from many different parts of the world. And we really wanted to bring as many people as we could together today to present uh, materials about those schools, but also the temptation to go beyond those researchers and to invite other uh, academics, curators, artists, and thinkers to um, present um, additional materials. So I think what we're presenting is quite an eclectic group of presentations, um, but we tried to group them around a series of questions. So the first panel looks at um, questions of historical context. So why um, is it necessary to start a new school or why is it necessary to reform um, an education project in an existing school? What are the circumstances which, which lead to that? The second panel addresses uh, spatiality and it has a particularly architectural focus that looks at the campus, it looks at campus architecture, and it looks at the development of architectural projects within kind of new architectural teaching situations. And the third panel um, is thinking about the curriculum, thinking about the curriculum as something which can f facilitate um, creative experimentation or can perhaps limit it. So the curriculum or the institution. So how do teachers um, work within a curriculum or an institution or how do they transgress it? So those are the three, the three panels that we have today.